and it's a go. Okay, folks, thank you very much um, for coming out um, to listen to this presentation. As Gabriela mentioned, um, I'm from Miami, and I've been working in the world of BIM now, um, approaching almost uh, 20 years. So today's presentation is not going to be my usual, uh, very rehearsed presentation. We're going to uh, touch a couple different subjects. One, I am going to address the to BIM or not to BIM question. Uh, this is uh, extremely important. We're also going to address the question of working in a global situation in the building construction industry, as you probably are all well aware of already. The building construction industry is globalizing, and this is adding new levels of pressure to the uh, construction industry. And to help frame this in reality and to land it in the city that I'm from, we are going to look at this in the biggest project happening in Miami. The Brickell City Center project is about 5.9 million square feet. It's a mixed use development. It, it, it spans five entire city blocks. And remember, city blocks in Miami are very big. We have to accommodate cars. So they're, a little, they're even bigger than uh, city blocks you see here in Europe. And of course, this was one firm's journey into BIM, going from not knowing about BIM and taking on the biggest project in town over a six-year window. And the firm that did this was uh, Architectonica, and I had the pleasure of interviewing them. So a big portion of my presentation is going to give you an intimate look at the realities of the BIM process. A little bit about me, why, why me, why FIQ, why we're here. Um, I think it's important for me to lay down um, a little bit about who, you know, who I am, what am I about, and one of those things has to do with the building construction industry working as an integrated enterprise and managing information over the life cycle of a building. So this has been very critical and has been the pursuit of what I've been uh, working for the last 20 years to bring to the AC industry. Personally, myself, I got about 3,400 hours in BIM in my organization, and FIQ was founded in 2006 to allow the building construction industry to embrace BIM. In 2007, I was one of the co-founders of the Building Smart Alliance in the United States. This is an organization that has uh, spearheaded BIM not only in America, but has worked multinationally, including here in Germany. There's a German chapter of the Building Smart Alliance here in Germany that is working towards integrating the building construction industry and building standards. A few ground rules, a few base, a few, a few base assumptions uh, I wanted to just kind of lay down as a foundation uh, based on things that we think about BIM that we think are important and are valuable. One of those is that we believe that there is a value in moving towards an integrated state. We've been working independently for many years. We are making the assumption that by integrating our process, that is going to generate value. Let's see. Another core assumption is that we want to minimize non-value added activities. So you ever find yourself doing something in a very inefficient way, we're trying to reduce, you know, BIM is trying to reduce waste in process. <coughs> Improving collaboration. This is another topic. If you don't believe that there's value and improving collaboration, probably BIM might not be for you. This one may be a little bit unique to my perspective, but I'll throw it out there anyway. Uh, we believe in one version of the truth. The truth might have multi sides. You could look at truth from the perspective of an architect, an engineer, a contractor, or an owner, but we want to be looking at the same truth, even if we look at it from multiple perspectives. We also believe that 3D is a universal language. And we're gonna be talking a little bit about language because BIM is about communication. If we weren't talking to other people, we wouldn't care about language. 
So another one is interoperability. And we believe that interoperability represents a major uh, source of waste in the building construction industry. If you're not familiar with the term interoperability, it basically means the ability of people, product, and process to be able to work together with others. If you, this PowerPoint presentation is an example of interoperability. I did this in a PC computer. I'm on a Mac computer. I was able to open my presentation. Thank God that it works. That is an example of interoperability. Another example of interoperability is the fact that you're understanding me and I'm speaking English. Puedo estar hablando en español. But we're speaking a common language and through that common language, we're able to communicate. This is very important in BIM. And another uh, idea I wanted to share with you was the idea of managing information through the life cycle. That means design, construction, and operations. As my friend Boris here uh, is gonna share with me, right? sorry about this Boris, I'm not hijacking his presentation. <laughs> Beam is not new, and he's going to say that, and I am going to second him in saying that. Uh, other industries have embraced BIM, uh, automotive, aerospace, defense, advanced manufacturing has already embraced BIM. They don't call it BIM, which could be a little confusing at times. They call it PLM, they call it uh, all kinds of other things. But essentially, they're building smart models with data that they're managing a global supply chain to be able to construct, design, engineer, manufacture, and service all kinds of products in the world, why can't we do that in the building industry? Not too far from the building industry in my hometown, Miami, uh, there's a big company called Royal Caribbean Cruise Lines, which was the first place I actually started my career. Sometimes people will ask me, how did you get involved with BIM? I say I started BIM virtually building cruise ships, so I've learned more about building buildings by building cruise ships than uh, uh, that I ever learned from building buildings, mostly because cruise ships are floating cities. So the shipbuilding industry, which is very close, it's a close cousin, it's a floating building, right? Floating city, uh, has already embraced BIM and has been doing so for at least, that I know of for sure, at least the last 20 years. So my presentation today is going to touch on a couple facts. So I am going to address the question, to BIM or not to BIM? Once we address that question, we're gonna move on and look at uh, Arquitectonica's, the Brickle City Center project, one of the largest projects in Miami. Uh, within that project, there was an interesting component called the Climate Ribbon, which is sort of the design centerpiece of the building that kind of sort of makes it unique other than a sort of traditional uh, mixed-use development type building. Once we are done looking at Arquitectonica's project, I'm going to address BIM from what the industry is now calling level one, two, and three. And different people are in different parts of the journey on where they see BIM at. Uh, some are at level one, some are at two, and some places have moved on to three. So we'll discuss what, those, what do those exactly mean. And then at the end, I'm going to close with a conversation quickly related to collaboration and integration. So let's deal with it. To BIM or not to BIM. This slide that you're looking at is looking at uh, BIM from a couple different perspectives. So let me lay down some, some groundwork here. From a technology perspective, what is a BIM technology? Well, if you look on the right-hand side, you're going to see that BIM today, from a technology side, is A, a model. B is parametric. D has a database, and a C can export an IFC. An IFC is the open exchange standard format for the building construction industry. That's BIM today. BIM tomorrow, is going to have something called a common data environment. And the infrastructure is already partially laid out by the IFC. 
And what's going to allow us, even though this little image here on the right isn't very fantastic, is incredibly important because the C, the common data environment, is what's going to allow you to globally collaborate tomorrow. So to BIM, it means to model. So yes, you are going to be developing and designing a building in 3D, starting in 3D and carrying it as much as possible in 3D through the entire process. Another idea is to share data. If you do a BIM model and you don't share your model with nobody, you're not doing BIM. BIM is about sharing. There's a difference between sending and sharing. When, um, I don't know if you've ever given this any thought, but when you send a model to somebody, you've created an obsolete piece of data that's traveling around the world. Um, pretty soon we're going to be sharing the model, which means that you're gonna be giving somebody global access to your data in a controlled way. So sharing is a very important idea. Collaboration, right? If you're not collaborating, and that collaboration bubble can get very small or very big. For some people, collaboration could be just working with, in your office with your team on the same model. That bubble could grow a little bigger and say, you're working with others outside of your firm uh, in the design phase with, with the model. And that bubble can grow a little bit bigger to now include the contractors and the subcontractors, you know, co-authoring the BIM model. That can grow a little bit bigger for the entire portfolio of a developer being managed in BIM all over the world and into operations. So how far do you want to collaborate? We also want to talk about um, to BIM also means to integrate. But integrate what? Well, I like the three Ps. People, product, and process, okay? It's not just about the building. It's, Boris is gonna talk about a four-legged stool. I'm talking about at least three, okay? You at least need to, to deal with three of these. If you have two, you're in trouble. To BIM also means to be sustainable. So a lot of the BIM discussion revolves around the reduction of waste in people, product, and process. To innovate, this is a funny word, but yes, um, nobody wants last year's cell phone, right? We always want the next bigger and better thing. Uh, the building industry needs to be innovative. If you want to embrace innovation, you gotta look at the possibilities of what technology can render you and how it can change the design process. So to innovate is important. And to interoperate. This is not only uh, a technology problem, different softwares coming together to work together, but it also means people coming together to work. It doesn't matter how good the technology is at working together, if people don't want to work together, they're not going to. So um, this is also a people discussion. The definition of BIM, a digital representation of a physical and functional model. So think about that for a moment, physical, so in other words, the BIM has to be equal to the building, but it also has to represent the function of what the building is designed to do and that needs to be simulated in the model. BIM as a shared knowledge resource. Uh, it's kind of a funny thing. When you have a shared knowledge resource, the model doesn't really belong to anybody, it belongs to us. I know where you're going. It's a, it's a group thing. Right, it's a group, it's a joint asset. And this is uh, very important too, forming a reliable basis for decisions. If you cannot use the model to make any meaningful decision, you enter what we, we kindly like to call in Miami, the useless BIM scenario, okay? You need to be able to use it to make decisions, to build the building, to construct, if you're not, you're doing something else, but you're not doing BIM. So let's address the not to BIM. And yes, there might be some cases when you probably uh, don't want to BIM. And who are those non-BIM people out there? Where obviously is nobody in this room. 
Don't be offended. And if you are in this room, I won't look at you, I promise. Okay. People who don't want to BIM like the status quo. They don't want anything to change. They're happy making money, doing whatever it is that they do, and they want no one to interrupt that process in any way. The status quo. Okay. They also have um, a problem with, we call it myopia, which means they only see the world from their perspective only. This could be an architect who only cares about his design process and does not care about anybody else's process anywhere in the entire value chain, just their little nugget. So you need to not only obviously take care of your interests, but you also have to expand it to include other people's perspective as well. So you, if you're suffering from myopia, yeah, BIM is not going to work for you. Let's see. If you are in a predatorial business model, of course, no one in this room is in one of those, but they believe it or not, some people make money off of waste. Not only the people who pick up the garbage, but some people make money off of waste. So if your business model requires lots of waste to make lots of profit, BIM is probably not so good for you. Okay? Let's see. Those who have not reinvested in people, product, and process. Notice that I said people, right? If you have one of these firms that you never pay for any training, any support, you don't ever buy a better computer, you don't invest in a better chair for ergonomics, you're probably not the big person, okay? Let's see. If you're trapped in a serial process and you cannot imagine a building being built by multiple people at the same time, you're not going to understand the BIM process. We're entering a situation where a model could be co-authored with people contributing in real time from around the world. If you like to hide in your process and you don't like to show other people what you're doing, BIM may not work for you. Okay. Another important one is trust. Believe it or not, a lot of people in the building industry don't trust each other. This something has something to do with uh, really bad contractual uh, contracts that pin architects against contractors and creates conflict by definition. But if you do not trust the people you're working with, you can't do BIM. Paper-based. If you only understand the world and managing a project from a paper, paper perspective only, you're not going to understand that a BIM model carry his data. Today we might come to a piece of paper for, for information, but tomorrow you will go to a BIM model to find your information. So we're shifting from a paper-based process to a, a digital process. Also, if you've invested a lot in CAD technology, once upon a time CAD technology was the cutting edge thing, right? And if you've bought a lot of technologies and built a lot of details and layers, and you've trained your entire office and you finally got it right, now comes somebody here to say that, oh, now you have to do BIM, means that you have a high exiting cost from a proven known process and it may be difficult for you to shift into the new process. Uh, those people who are struggling with a high exiting cost and can't bear the loss are going to struggle with BIM. Fear of change, you know who they are. There's people who absolutely are panicky about all kinds of things, losing their jobs, becoming obsolete, uh, you know, shift in power within the organization. All these kinds of strange things uh, get all rattled up the moment you embrace BIM. So those are the people who are, they don't want to know about BIM. So Architectonica, uh, decided that they were going to do this enormous project. And in 2010, they had to ask themselves the question, do we BIM this job or do we do it the way that we know how? This was the biggest project the firm had embraced at the time. And the year was 2010. Finding people who even knew BIM in Miami at that time was hard to come by. So. They, uh, for the point of this conversation, they decided to jump in and uh, we're gonna learn a little bit about their story. 
So let's see if we can get lucky here. I'm gonna click this button. This is a three minute video on the project. This is the audio. The mixed use concept that Swire embraces, I think is very much about building locally, thinking globally, and of course, planning masterfully. The vision for Brickell City Center really, I think, uh, began a number of years ago. Having developed Brickell Key, we were very much aware that the retail opportunity that existed here in Brickell was real. And that is where Brickell City Center arrives, is the coming of age of Brickell Avenue, is its own Rockefeller Center. It is the type of project that was missing for the downtown Brickell district. There are three residential towers, three office buildings, two hotels. All of this happens above the three levels of retail and entertainment over four city blocks. I saw Brickleby as really the beginning of downtown Miami. It's become a huge cultural center. And that's what we were trying to uh, express in um, all the architectural graphics. We love the idea of this notion of the circle or the dot as something that could actually go from the scale of a business card to a building. It has a kind of ambiguous scale. Because you can have an intimate experience with it where you're up close and it becomes more abstract. And then you have the viewing of it as an identity sign from a distance where it becomes part of the architecture. We proposed two things that were quite innovative and unprecedented. The first was to build below grade parking uh, under the city streets. By putting below grade, we were able to create an on grade shopping center that flows from block to block, from street to street freely. There are no barriers. This is a fully integrated project. It integrates the city into itself and vice versa. The second piece of it really was connectivity over the streets. We have uh, a further element that enhances that dramatically, and that is our climate ribbon. Well, the climate ribbon tells a story. It tells a story about Miami, about the climate. The streetscape has to be uh, outdoors. And the problem is, how do you make a streetscape outdoors comfortable? The only tools we have to do that are the shade and to create a gentle breeze. The unique side of that is how to marry that together into one architectural composition. The underside of the climate ribbon is, this, is a soft sort of undulating form. There's a series of louvers that are beneath the glass whose orientation is very specifically designed to protect the shop fronts from direct sun. It captures the trade winds that flow from the Caribbean into Miami. It's an environmental solution instead of a mechanical solution. The proximity of uh, Brickell City Center to the public transportation system, and in particular the Metro Mover, is fundamental. The future is in mass transit. We're building a whole new station where the old station was, linking directly on level three of the shops. In the beginning, we talked about um, uh, our retail being in the heart of Brickell. And I think now we would more likely say that it is the heart of Brickell. It's Brickell City Center. It's the center of a city. It's the heart. We really have an opportunity to change our city, to make Miami more special, to continue to rise. Well, I hope you enjoyed that um, little video. So. Arquitectonica was gracious enough to allow me to drill them for about two solid days and four hours of direct solid interview uh, on this project. And they opened the doors and they took a risk and they answered questions honestly. So in 2016, who is Arquitectonica and how has been changed ARQ's practice. The company is about 40 years old. It includes architecture, interior design, landscape, and urban design. It has three offices in the United States and seven offices worldwide. The firm started in a pencil 
and paper process lived through the CAD era and now had to embrace BIM. So it's seen multiple generational changes in process within its lifetime. The BIM process changed Arquitectonica in the sense that BIM became a heavier, more intense front end process that they didn't uh, anticipate. The project included a multi-level residential office and a multi-site project. So BIM had to embrace a very, very large scale project. From the leadership perspective, the owners of the firm, why did they choose to do BIM? Bernard specifically wanted to improve quality control issues within the firm. They were interested, of course, increasing the productivity and improving the office efficiency. In addition to that, uh, they wanted to sort of standardize the office across 10 offices. So if you go to Miami and you drink a Coca-Cola, it should taste like a Coca-Cola. If you go to New York, it should taste like a Coca-Cola in New York. And if I had a Coca-Cola in Berlin, it should still taste like a Coca-Cola in Berlin. We want that to be the same thing to be true for an architectural practice. They want to maintain the same standard across their entire global footprint. They don't want regional differences and drops in quality control from one location to the next. Uh, embrace design and project development from a 3D process and perspective. So, Originally, they were developing projects, thinking about them as, oh, you know, in the back of your mind, you know it, the building's always a 3D, but they wanted the design process to always embrace the three-dimensional element. And, and this was a major driver as well for them to adopt BIM. From a tr strategy perspective, let's see, from, I asked them what was their strategy for embracing BIM within the office and specifically on this project. Well, one of those strategy had to do with 3D visualization and ideation. Currently, they don't use BIM on the front end visualization aspect, but they use it more in the production process of the firm. Internally, they're working in a technology called Revit. Um, In-house, they're looking to improve the internal collaboration of the design team within the organization as their first objective for embracing BIM. Second objective for embracing BIM was that they wanted to improve the collaboration with outside consultants, specifically on the city project, city Brickle project, because there were so many consultants involved on, on that project. Something else that was very interesting about Arquitectonica too was that in addition to having uh, a drive to improve internal office standards, they also manage their own BIM library. They, uh, this they kind of differ from the status quo of people who are doing BIM they don't want their employees just going to the web and grabbing a model from the cloud and just dropping it into the project. There's a vetting process um, for the library components that they use of how they manage their data and sort of product approval process that has to be embraced before an employee can just reach in and grab a model. So on, on one half, they want to maintain high office standards with flexibility. So if a project calls for some shifts, um, they allow that to happen as well. How did BIM change the culture uh, in the office? Ann Carter, who spoke with me, said that it made design more conscious. Sometimes when you were working in the 2D process, you didn't really understand the full impact of what you were doing. But when you were able to embrace it 
in, in the BIM process, you were able to understand the impact of those decisions on the project, and, and that was a big shift in, in the culture there. Another thing that's uh, interesting is sub-involvement uh, requires a shift in time. She mentioned that in a traditional office setting, the subs would come in and they would want to get in and out of the project fast, quickly. Especially in Miami's high-paced condo development market, they don't really extend the design process. So there's a cultural shift with subcontractors coming in and their participation in the BIM process requires more involvement and more commitment of time um, that changes the dynamics of how they've worked with people in the past. BIM is a more design activities. I mentioned that a little bit. She mentioned that the BIM process was definitely um, more fulfilling and that 3D was a common language. So the owners, uh, non-technical people, understood the project better by embracing the BIM. Then I asked um, the tough questions related to staffing. What do you do about staffing? So if you imagine you have an architectural firm and they have their employees and they, the knowledge is captured in the older generations, what do you do about staffing? Do you fire the old people, bring in the new people? What, what's the situation there? The situation there was that she said that BIM wasn't an age thing, which was kind of good to hear. And she said that what really drove the bus on BIM was interest. So whether it was younger generations or older generations, interest is what really drove the adoption of BIM and who was doing it in the office. The office, um, this is also interesting, the office supported ongoing training and education activities on an ongoing basis to support the team over a six year period while uh, working on this project. Also, they didn't do um, they didn't do anything different as far as how the teams were organized. The design teams were still the design teams, and the production teams were the production teams. And how they were structured didn't shift too much there. From a practice perspective. Uh, there was sort of the knowledge transfer issue. So you have some generations, the people, uh, the seasoned people in the office who are adopting BIM, working with the newer generations of people who have come into the office. What she said about that was that the open office plan really fostered uh, internal collaboration with the team where people can kind of walk over and sit in front of a computer and talk about a problem and look at it and resolve it. So BIM had, as I mentioned before, little uh, impact on the structure. I see everyone is expected. Yes. Everyone was expected to model. So for example, no one was uh, an expert, for example, in building libraries or applying the model. Everyone needed to know how to apply the model and everyone needs to know how to create families. This was um, an interesting question because I was wondering if they were going to restructure the office on how to embrace BIM, but there is an expectation that everyone sort of has to do it and everybody has to work with their piece of it. Products and services. This is an interesting question. I asked them if BIM had changed the products and services that um, the products and services that the firm offered. The answer was pretty much no. The Arquitectonica is known as a design firm, and 
they weren't changing their services to the client in any way. What they did do was that based on the desire of the design challenge, they would pick the BIM tool that would allow them to accomplish the design intent. And I think that was a very good uh, question. Then I hit them with the hard question about cost. Everyone's always wondering about cost. Who pays for the BIM? Do they expect a return on investment on BIM? Or is it just like paying the light bill? The answer is, it's like paying the light bill, okay? They, uh, they do experience less printing, uh, cost savings in the office related to printing in this. They print a lot less now than they did before. But no, um, BIM for them is an internal in-house operational expense like the brick and mortar. I asked them about the marketing and sometimes in the world of BIM, um, sometimes in the world of BIM, uh, we do what's called Hollywood BIM, where BIM is used only in the world of marketing and sales, but doesn't really make its way into the production environment. No, they don't use the BIM in the marketing at this time. Their perspective is that for the visualization and for the rendering and to be client facing, uh, other tools for visualization were more powerful and that the BIM tools right now are a little cumbersome for the visualization. Although they are aware that some people in the industry are dealing with this. From a tactical perspective, BIM is helping the firm greatly impact the quality control aspect. They believe that it's increasing efficiency faster turnaround for design changes. BIM is helping them maintain the office standards from office to office. BIM is helping mandate the office standard. Okay, I mentioned that. From a governance perspective, what drives the construction? Does the model drive the construction or does the 2D documentation drive the construction? This was really important. Sometimes the BIM and the drawings are one and the same, and sometimes they are not. From a construction perspective, at this time, the 2D document is driving, but they said some things that were very interesting related to this, and they said that in order for the BIM to become the contract document of record in the project, it needs to be frozen and it needs to be published in a controlled way. Until they can guarantee that they can freeze the model and handle it as a frozen deliverable that they can control and make sure it doesn't get manipulated, there's a possibility that the model could become a contractual document. The second limitation to that idea was that sometimes the model does not have all the data. So the model sometimes is incomplete as a contractual document. That information may exist in some other form and specifications or into the documents. So the model doesn't have all the goods yet. From an infrastructure perspective, the BIM process, especially this particular project, really challenged the firm. They had to upgrade computers. They had to upgrade video cards. And because they were dealing with um, remote sites, the IT infrastructure and specifically had to become gigabit in order to handle gigabit transfers at a very large rate. This in Miami, um, imagine Germany probably similar, uh, most people are not at gigabit speed. So you're lucky in Miami if you have 20, 30, if you're on the high end, you have 150 megabytes per second. Architectonica was one gigabit plus in their infrastructure. I asked them about the client, the client's expectation on BIM. What does the client want? Are they asking for it? At this time, there is a perceived expectation that the BIM will improve coordination and reduce 
specifically construction uh, errors. There's no particular language yet that they're using. Uh, the owner is asking for BIM. They're relying on the AIA to help with uh, language related to that, but that is uh, something that's still in process. Guys, I'm gonna end on one slide because this presentation is a lot richer and we don't have time to complete all of it. But let me um, close with saying the value. So, at the end I asked them what was the value of BIM to the firm and they, uh, their answer was it improved in-house office collaboration with and, without, uh, and outside consultants and with collaboration with the general contractor and the subs. It improved the communication of the design intent with the owner and the extended team. It improved the quality of the design documents, less errors, greater confidence in the deliverables, and reduced project risks. Guys, thank you very much. I hope you enjoy the next presentation. We will be posting uh, much more detail about this project and Hector's uh, presentation in the AIA Europe website uh, for the ones that are interested, okay? Thank you.